All right, so welcome everyone to our third session of our anti-racism lecture series for the spring 2021 semester. So our topic of today, or rather for today, is uh, racism. Um, I mean, so I get my handy dandy cheat sheet here. So our legacies of apartheid um, in South Africa. Um, and we're delighted to be joined by Professor Ben Lammers here at um, Caldwell. Um, so I know that we have been going over this in too much detail, we don't really have a whole lot of ground rules, but if we had any, right, so they'd be, of course, right, so keep your mic muted unless you're speaking. Um, to the best of our abilities, if we can try to keep our cameras on, that helps with the uh, engagement for our facilitators. Um, and as I understand it, today's lecture won't just be, rather today's conversation, rather, won't be just a strict lecture as in the past. It'll be kind of a presentation, discussion, right? So that'll be for both, I believe, today and uh, next week, but I'm gonna let uh, Ben uh, speak more about that. Um, and as always, if we record the first parts of the session, um, and for this content specifically, we'll probably record both of them. Um, and then towards the end of uh, today's uh, content, we'll share that information. So we created um, our own YouTube channel. So we have all our uh, racism, rather anti-racism lecture series, uh, getting those up on that channel. Um, so that is all about in terms of like the Q and A or kind of checking materials. With that, I'm gonna mute my mic now and turn it over to uh, Ben. So take it away. All right, thanks, Abdul. Um, so I know that in the past, some of these sessions have been, you know, the first week was sort of lecture and then the second week more discussion. Um, I'm hoping to do a sort of more uh, mix and match approach so that um, it'll be a mixture of both, both weeks. Uh, so certainly I would say this week and next week as well, if you're here next week, um, I would encourage anyone to interrupt me at any time. Um, I can't see you once I start presenting. So if you have a question, comment, anything at all, feel free to unmute and just cut me off. Um, I have teenagers, so I'm used to it. Um, so please feel free at any time. Um, if you have a question, just to jump right in. Um, and in terms of before I start the presentation, um, when the call went out last fall for this lecture series, uh, because I teach an honors class on South Africa, I, I tried to think about, well, how might that fit into the, the purpose of the lecture series? Um, and I didn't want to just talk about South Africa, right? Um, I wanted to hopefully try to find a way to connect it to the concerns of this lecture series. Um, and that's why I thought about this uh, idea of sort of the legacy of apartheid. Because of course, some of the, uh, many of the debates we're having in the contemporary United States are about how we are dealing or not dealing with the legacies of our own history. And so I thought it might be an interesting comparative perspective to, to look at South Africa, which has some similarities to US history, but also many differences. So what I'm gonna to try to do, and I'll start the presentation now. So what I'll try to do this week are really the, the three things that you see on the screen. Um, to provide a, a definition of apartheid, what it is and how it worked, um, because I think that's important for discussing the legacy part that we'll be focusing on la later. Very briefly, just look at how apartheid comes to an end. And the reason we're going to do that is because that's crucial for understanding uh, the successes and, and some of the areas of, of failure in South African history to deal with the legacies of apartheid. And then sort of look at this idea of the rainbow nation that um, came up at the end of apartheid, this idea that South Africa was going to be a kind of model for the world um, and that will sort of lead into our discussion of, of the legacies of apartheid and how they've been dealt with or not um, in the subsequent period since the um, end of apartheid. So because I am hoping to, to make this a little more interactive, um, why don't we just start with this term apartheid? I'm curious, what, what does it mean to people who are here? You know, if, if someone said to you, what does this term mean? What would be your definition? Uh-oh. Silence. <laughs> to me, turned into my it, class. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it would be a brutal regime that um, brutalized um, the citizens of South Africa with no concern to see the, to elevate the people, no human, no humanity in the way they, treated them. That's what I would say. Okay. Uh, I agree with that 100%. Uh, any other associations anybody has with, with this term? Do, do you feel familiar with it? Or, you know, it's been over now for over 25 years. Sorry. 
you think of Mel Nelson Mandela, right? About Mandela a little bit uh, tonight, later on, hopefully. Yeah. Any other specific associations anybody has? Yeah, so I have a, um, an association. Um, I think of the hip hop group uh, Public Enemy, because in a lot of their songs from the, the 80s, not a lot, I can't tell how many, but some of their content, right, spoke about racism, anti-racism, but they also mentioned apartheid. And I think I was I was still young at that time, so that's why how I began to associate the word and kind of find found uh, found a meaning for it. Yeah, in in the eighties, um, there was quite a bit of, of popular culture uh, in the United States and around the world that um, took up the sort of anti-apartheid cause. Uh, the anti-apartheid cause became, um, for lack of a better word, kind of trendy in the nineteen eighties. Um, I had a high school teacher actually who uh, said that uh, he was going to rent a bus and we were all going to bus down to Washington and, and protest outside the South African embassy um, and all get arrested because a lot of people were doing that. Um, but then Amy Carter did it. And so he decided it wasn't cool anymore. So it never happened. Um, but certainly there was a, a lot of attention to South Africa through popular culture, through music, especially um, in that period. Um, there's a really fantastic uh, documentary called Amandla which is owned by the Caldwell Library, um, which is about the role of music and the anti-apartheid struggle. Fantastic, highly recommend it if you have any interest. Um, so what I wanna do first of all is, is focus on this idea of, of defining apartheid. So I'll start with this quote uh, from the, the South African academic Deborah Pozel, um, who points out that the, the champions of apartheid, first and foremost, were interested in preserving uh, white racial political supremacy. But secondly, uh, also trying to sustain white um, economic prosperity and superiority, right? So this is a, a lecture series on anti-racism um, and apartheid clearly was a project designed to preserve white supremacy. So it was a, a racist project built on ideas of race. And so what we want to do first of all is try to understand, well, what did that actually mean? What did it look like? What were its components? So what I've tried to do is identify sort of five what you might call pillars of apartheid, the key components for understanding apartheid and how it worked. Um, the first of these pillars of apartheid, really the, the foundational building block of everything else that we associate with apartheid is racial classification. So in order to understand apartheid, it's important to understand that there was a very legalistic approach to classifying all South African citizens. Um, this was put in place by something called the Population Registration Act of 1950, uh, which required that all South Africans be given an official racial identity, right? So South African racial identities um, were codified, legalized, made official um, with, for some people, catastrophic results. Um, so you'll see the picture there of Sandra Lang. Sandra's in the middle uh, with her parents. Uh, Sandra Lang is um, a, a famous, famous case study in the, the ludicrousness and the tragedy of the racial classification system uh, created by apartheid. Sandra Lang's parents were classified as white, um, but as you might be able to tell from the picture, Sandra Lang, um, her skin tone was darker than that of her parents. Her hair was different. And when she started school, other pupils and their families started to ask questions. Uh, and eventually, despite the fact that her parents were classified legally as white, the South African state classified her in a different racial category. Um, and so she was expelled from school. She eventually ran away from home, uh, became estranged from her parents. She never reconciled with her, her father. She managed to reconcile with her mother sometime around 2001 after apartheid was over, right before she died. Um, but her life was destroyed by racial classification. Um, and so a sort of great example of this system in practice. And one of the really striking things about the Population Registration Act and how this system of racial classification worked in apartheid South Africa was how haphazard it was. Um, there was no manual. There was no um, series of guidelines for how this classification should take place. So Deborah Pozel, uh, the academic that I looked at a minute ago, um, has done a lot of great work showing that it was really idiosyncratic. 
that the way you might be classified really depended on the person who was classifying you. So, so for some people, it was very impressionistic. Where did you live? Um, who was in your social circle? That determined in their eyes your racial, racial classification. Whereas for some other people, they attempted to be more what they considered to be scientific. So they would base it on physical examination, for example. Uh, so infamously, some um, South African government officials used what they what they called the pencil test, uh, which was they would stick a pencil in your hair and see if it would fall out. And if it fell out, you were white. Um, and so this is another sign of the ludicrousness of, of this system. So what the racial classification of apartheid did is it took an incredibly diverse population and tried to place it into racially defined boxes. So in this slide, I've just tried to give you a sense of the diversity of South African society. One of the things that's really important to understand about South Africa is that it's a really diverse place. Um, so if we think about how people identify themselves in contemporary South Africa, in terms of the ethnic group to which they belong, um, mm. there's a wide variety. Um, South Africa is a country with 11 official languages. Um, using an ATM in South Africa is quite the experience. Um, and you can see some of those groups here. Not all of them are represented because there's too many. Um, and so you can see that there are a variety of groups. Most of the people that you see here, the individuals you see here are um, South African political figures. There's four either current or former presidents of South Africa represented here, as well as some people from South African literature and film. Um, so the woman, the Sutu woman that you see on the, the bottom left is Terry Feto, who's was in a movie called uh, Totsi, another very good film that won the Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film in, I think, the late 90s. So South Africa was a, a diverse place, and that's a product of its history that I won't get into. But what apartheid did is it took this diversity and repackaged it along the lines of race um, and created a system that looked like this. And so under apartheid, all South Africans were classified into one of four racially defined groups. Um, those who are classified as white, uh, those who are classified as Africans, sometimes referred to as Bantu people. Bantu is a linguistic term um, referring to African languages, but it was adopted by the apartheid state as a kind of uh, terminology to refer to um, black African people. Um, you also have in South Africa a very complicated category called colored. does not mean what it means in the United States. It's a different term um, with a very complicated history. It would take me the remainder of the time tonight to explain the origins of this term. Um, but it was a separate group under apartheid classification. And there's also a South Asian and Indian population in South Africa as, and South Africa as well. So apartheid took this complicated society and created four boxes. And everybody had to go into one of these four boxes. Um, and the box in which you were placed essentially determined your life. It determined who you were allowed to marry. It determined who you were allowed to have sex with. It determined where you were allowed to live, the job you were allowed to hold, whether or not you could vote. Um, it really conditioned almost every element of your life. Um, you can see that I've also put at the top the, the two divisions between European and non-European, because as we'll see when we look at some examples, um, in many cases, when apartheid ideology was applied in practice, it took this four-part division and broke it into two simpler divisions. So some things were reserved for so-called Europeans, which essentially meant white people, um, and those referred to as non-European. So this is the first pillar of apartheid a system of racial classification that divided the population and gave everyone a legally defined racial identity. The second pillar of apartheid is white political supremacy, is the domination of the country politically by the white population, which of course, if we go back to here, the white population, which was very much the minority. Um, so you can see, this is South Africa today, roughly, you can see that the Afrikaner population, Afrikaners are people whose ancestry is primarily Dutch. Um, you also have English speaking whites whose uh, ancestry is largely from Great Britain. Uh, there's also a very small Jewish population that can trace their ancestry to Eastern Europe. So in today's South Africa, the white population is eight, 9% of the total. 
When apartheid was first created, it was closer to 20%, but still clearly the minority. So this is a, a creation of a system um, designed to benefit uh, very much the minority of the population. The overwhelming majority um, of South Africans fit into the, the African category of apartheid um, and are members of the various ethnic groups, some of which are shown here. So the second pillar is to preserve the dominance of the country by its white minority. Um, whites had dominated South African politics really for centuries, so this predates apartheid. But one of the real pillars of apartheid is the preservation of that domination um, by the white minority. So I've just given you here this quote um, from a letter that was written by the private secretary of the prime minister of the time, a guy named D.F. Milan, that was written to the African National Congress, which was the liberation organization, the anti-apartheid organization that Mandela was associated with where the guy said very openly, very blatantly, you know, we are in no way interested in any executive or legislative power being given to what it refers to as Bantu men and women, Africans, um, over Europeans. And so a very open, blatant statement that the government is determined to preserve um, the political domination of the country by the white minority. This is in many ways one of the simplest pillars of apartheid. Because how was white political supremacy maintained? Very simple. Non-whites were not eligible to vote um, or participate in government. Um, so the maintenance of white political supremacy was a, a very simple matter indeed, because the mechanisms of politics were completely off limits to anyone who was not labeled white under the apartheid system of racial classification. The third pillar of apartheid is perhaps the most famous. Um, this is the segregation of public space. And here's where we see a strong similarity to the history of the United States. Uh, so for example, there's a lot of similarities to some of the things we'll see here um, and uh, Jim Crow in uh, the American South. Um, this is sometimes referred to as petty apartheid, um, small scale apartheid, as opposed to the grand apartheid that I'll look at in a minute. Um, and petty apartheid is the attempt to segregate almost all aspects of public space in South African society. So the sign that you see here from the city of Durban, uh, which is on the east coast of South Africa, uh, where you can see at the top, uh, it says that the beach is reserved for the sole use of members of the white race group. Um, and so this is petty apartheid um, in action. And there's sort of innumerable examples that we could look at um, of this. Uh, so this photograph uh, is a reflection of that policy. You'll notice the difference between this photograph and the previous one. In this photograph, it refers to the white race group. In this photograph, it uses the terminology of European. Um, that was typical of the early period of apartheid. When apartheid was first created, it tended to use the label European and non-European. Um, later on, historically, um, the labels changed to white and non-white. Um, and actually, one of the reasons for that um, is because of Americans, because the story goes that in the 1960s, especially apartheid was created in 1948. Um, in the 1960s, when international travel was becoming more common, you had more and more Americans who would travel to South Africa. Um, and when they arrived at the airport, um, they would be directed to go in one of two directions. There was a line on one side for Europeans, and there was another line for non-Europeans. And Americans would look at those um, labels and think, well, I'm not a European. And so they would go to the non-European line, not understanding that in South Africa, non-European meant black. Um, and so uh, partly as a result of international travel, the South African state changed its terminology um, in the 1960s. So when you see a photograph like this one that uses the language of European um, or non-European, it tells you that it's probably a photograph from the 1950s or perhaps the early 1960s. This is a very famous uh, photograph from 1956. There's a long tradition of fantastic photojournalism in South Africa. Um, and Peter Mag Magabane is, is a great example of that. Um, this photograph, um, I think, encapsulates a lot of uh, the nature of apartheid. Um, any comments on this photo? When you look at this photo, what do you see? 
you would say the black lady is a nanny taking care of the white child, but not allowed to sit on the same bench as the child. So exactly right. Um, extremely common for white families in South Africa during apartheid to have a nanny, um, usually a live-in nanny. Live-in servants were very common. Um, even a, a sort of regular middle-class South African white family would probably have three live-in servants, a nanny, a gardener, and, and a cook, um, perhaps more if they were more affluent. Um, and you know what Magabani captured so well in this photograph, right, is exactly the division that you're referring to, um, that she's the nanny, she's taking care of the child, uh, but she's not allowed to sit on the same bench um, that she is. Um, and this relationship between nannies and children is a, is a wonderful sort of window into some of the, the tragedy of apartheid. Um, so I'm just gonna divert down the path of nannies for a minute because it, some of my favorite photographs from the apartheid era are on this subject. Um, so this photograph, for example, taken by another one of these uh, wonderful South African photojournalists, Ernest Cole, um, another photo of a nanny and child, and, and Ernest Cole interviewed the, the nanny and got this um, quote from her where she said that, you know, servants are not forbidden to love. Um, and I love this child, she says, even though she will grow up to treat me just like her mother does. Um, and so this um, captures very well some of the dynamics that apartheid um, will create. Um, I also particularly love this photograph. This is a little bit later. This is 1964 by David Goldblatt, um, another photo of nanny and child. Um, this photograph always strikes me um, very much uh, I'm curious just to hear people's thoughts about this photograph and how you might read this image. Well, the English teacher in the group will jump in there. Right. I was just going to say a um, couple of things. The more that you look at it, right, that they are not facing each other, right, but facing the photographer, um, that he's standing, she's sitting, um, but each one of them is touching each other, right? She's reaching behind her to touch him so that embrace, that connection. Um, whatever they're sitting on, that's sort of an interesting you know, barrier, right? That's sort of splitting them, the log or, or something, but also bringing them together. I don't know, just to start. Yeah, I'm certainly always always struck by the, the the touching aspect of the photograph. But sorry, someone else was trying to speak. Yeah, no, I was just um, gonna say like, I mean, he's obviously it looks maybe younger than she is, but the standing over gives like a sense of like power of like one above the other. Um, just the fact that he's not just standing, but he's kind of like standing and she's specifically sitting, I guess. Yeah, it would be very interesting to know to what degree Goldblatt um, arranged this photograph, because certainly in, in the, the positions of the two people, the fact that he's standing in the, the existence to some degree of a barrier between them, that works very well. You know, did, is that just serendipity that it just happened or did Goldblatt um, sort of frame the photograph to produce that? Um, but, you know, the photograph is, is very similar to the previous one in, in, for me in that you know, it implies a, a genuine connection between these two human beings, uh, but a connection that will eventually be broken because of uh, the rules of apartheid, just as this, uh, this woman says, um, she will grow up to treat me just like her mother does. Um, in, the, in the documentary that I mentioned earlier, Mandla, which is in the, in the library, um, one of the people interviewed for this documentary is the great South African singer, Miriam Makeba. Um, and Miriam Makeba um, worked as a nanny when she was young before her career uh, as a singer took off. Um, and she says very powerfully in the, in the documentary that she worked as a nanny and that the, the hardest part for her of working as a nanny is she said, because I knew the child would grow up to call me the same names as their parents. Um, and so that sort of encapsulates one of the elements of this whole system. But we've digressed a little bit from the, the pillar of apartheid that we're talking about, which is um, the notion of the segregation of public space. And I've got tons of photographs on this. I'm not going to show you all of them. Um, but just to give you a few examples of the extent to which the South African state went to segregate public space. So park benches, as we saw earlier, um, 
ponds in parks, as we see here. Uh, phone booths, separate phone booths um, for the different racial groups, Europeans and non-Europeans in this particular case, um, even extending to things like taxi cabs or bank tellers. So we're not just talking about public space like parks or things like that. We're even talking about provision of services as well, all subject to the racial categorization, the racial classification created by the apartheid state. Public transportation, uh, as we see here, once again, using that terminology of Europeans and non-Europeans. Um, and I'd like to use this photograph in concert with this one, again, by Ernest Cole, um, because uh, what Ernest Cole demonstrates very clearly in this photograph is that just as in the United States, uh, separate was decidedly not equal, right? So we see the, the white portion of the platform, uh, which is uh, very much uncrowded, um, compared to the other portion of the platform, which was much more crowded. So it's not just that services were separate, that the services that were provided were decidedly uh, unequal in their quality. Um, and so this again is a vital pillar of apartheid, the creation of a segregated society in terms of public space. Uh, so this cartoon is to some degree mocking um, apartheid's uh, racial classifications um, and this cartoon, in fact, reflects uh, a real incident. So this is from a newspaper article in 1956, uh, reporting that uh, a European child, to use the apartheid lingo, a European child who had acquired a deep sunburn was actually thrown out of a train uh, by a conductor um, based on their perception of where the child belonged in the racial classifications of apartheid. Uh, this quote is actually from a book that was published, I think it was published in the 1970s, called Apartheid, The Lighter Side, which is a very strange title. Um, but the book is a collection of, of stories like this one, sort of nonsensical examples of the application of apartheid ideology to the real world. Because apartheid ideology didn't line up very well with the real world um, in many cases. Um, and it's a collection of the absurdities of apartheid, some of which are perhaps comical as is the case with this one, some of which are uh, much more tragic. Uh, one of the other stories in that book, Apartheid the Lighter Side, is uh, an incident that happened, I believe in the 1960s, where uh, two white teenagers were involved in an automobile accident. Um, and someone called for an ambulance and said, we have two injured boys, send an ambulance. But the person who took the call, uh, because in South Africa, just as in the United States, boy was a term that was often used to apply to uh, adult black men uh, as a sort of term of racist denigration. The person who took the call assumed that the victims of the car accident were black because they were referred to as boys. Um, and so they sent an ambulance for black people. Um, the ambulance was turned away because the victims were white. Uh, a replacement ambulance subsequently showed up um, but by that time, the two people had died. Uh, and so a, a small example of, again, the absurdities and the tragedies inflicted on a society based on these categorizations. Our fourth pillar of apartheid is residential segregation. So it's not just about segregation of park benches in public space. It's also about segregation of where people can live. And this took a variety of forms. Naturally, um, it meant that neighborhoods in urban areas were segregated. Officially, not unofficial segregation, official segregation. Where you could live was determined by the racial classification you had received from the state. In some cases, this involved uh, the destruction of neighborhoods that were rezoned for a different racial group. Uh, the most famous example of this is what you see represented here. There was a place called Sophia Town, which was um, outside of Johannesburg. Sophia Town was a largely African, but mixed race neighborhood. Um, and under apartheid ideology, this was not permissible. And so Sophia Town was raised. It was destroyed, paved over um, and rebuilt as a suburb for white people. Um, and so this photograph is sort of evocatively captures uh, this person departing Sophia Town, leaving behind the rubble of the community, which has been destroyed. And so this is another pillar of apartheid, the segregation of the country. Um, 
along residential lines. But what's important to understand about this, and this is a key point for understanding some of the legacies of apartheid, is that residential segregation wasn't just about creating separate neighborhoods in towns and cities along racial lines. The project of apartheid was much more ambitious than that. Um, and this is where we get to this individual here, Hendrik Verward, who was heavily involved in the creation of apartheid. He's often referred to as the architect of apartheid. He served uh, as prime minister of South Africa in the late 50s and into the 1960s. Um, this quote from Verward is a really important quote because it gets the point um, that I, I'm referring to here when we talk about this policy of segregation. Verwood said in 1961, uh, when I talk to the nation of South Africa, I talk of the white people of South Africa. Um, for Verward, segregation was not segregation in the sense that we might think of it as a way simply merely of separating different groups. That, of course, was what was happening. But to Verward, segregation was a reflection of a broader reality. Uh, Verward's reality was that South Africa was a country of white people, not in the sense that South Africa was a, a country that should be dominated by white people. Of course, he believed that. But in the sense that South Africa, properly speaking, was a country in which only white people could live. And this is why this quote is particularly vital. Now, what does that mean? South Africa is a country in which only white people can live. If we look at this map, even before apartheid, there had been the creation of various territories within South Africa that were set aside, designated for the various ethnic groups um, with the South African state called tribal groups in South African society. So you can see here, um, if you look at the top one, for example, uh, the Venda people who are from the very northern um, part of South Africa, you can see uh, their homeland there at the top, um, or the Indabele people who are right next to the Venda in the green, um, or uh, the Transkei, the pink, which is sort of down more to the bottom right. Uh, that was the homeland for Kosa people. Uh, Nelson Mandela is Kosa, for example, or in the area on the right labeled Natal, um, you can see that's KwaZulu, that was the Zulu homeland. The Zulu are the largest ethnic group in contemporary South Africa. Verward's vision was that all non-whites would live and be citizens of these territories, and everything else on this map would be South Africa, white South Africa. And so apartheid wasn't just a product of residential segregation of creating a situation where non-whites could only live in certain neighborhoods, for example. It was much grander than that. And this, this project of Bear Words is often referred to as grand apartheid. The segregation, not just of towns and cities, but of the entire country, and eventually excising, excluding territories in which non-white people lived and considering them not to be part of South Africa anymore. Uh, so that South Africa itself as Verward understood it, would be a country inhabited only by whites. So this is the idea of grand apartheid. However, there were lots and lots of non-white people who lived in white South Africa. They worked there. They worked as nannies. They worked in the mines. They worked as agricultural laborers. They worked in South African industry. But in Verward's conception of South Africa, they were not actually considered, or they should not be considered residents of South Africa. They were seen as temporary sojourners, temporary workers who would one day return to their proper homeland, which in many cases they had never been to. And so this cartoon from 1960 um, illustrates the point. So there's Verward in the center um, showing around a tourist. Um, and saying, well, you know, one of the first things you'll notice about South Africa um, is that there's no Africans here. That was my idea. And the joke of the cartoon, of course, is that Verward is surrounded by Africans. But in Verward, South Africa, um, those people, in essence, did not exist. They were temporary migrants. They were temporary laborers who would one day return to their proper homeland. So if anyone was at the first... <laughs> 
lecture in this series by Dr. Ling. Um, one of the things that Dr. Ling said that, that really struck me is, is he talked about what power is. Uh, and I don't remember his exact wording, but he said that power um, is the ability to define reality and then force other people to react to your definition of reality. And that I thought was a wonderful way of understanding what Verward was trying to do, to try and define a new reality under which South Africa was a country only of white people and to force everyone else in the country, who were of course the majority, to live as if that was a, a realistic proposition. And so residential segregation, the fourth pillar of apartheid, um, is not just about neighborhoods and where people can live in a specific town. It was a much grander ambition than that. Now, what this means, of course, is that lots and lots of people in the history of apartheid had to move, had to leave behind the areas in which they lived so they could live in the place that was um, assigned to them. Something like 3.5 million people were forcibly uprooted um, under apartheid. So when we think about the legacies of apartheid, um, that's a really important legacy to think of because there are today millions of South Africans um, who were uprooted from their homes and forcibly moved um, within living memory. Either it happened to themselves or it might've happened to their parents' generation or their grandparents' generation, but something that happened in the very recent past. And so when we think of this question of how South Africa wrestles with its history and its legacy of racism, that is a big piece of the puzzle uh, that is extraordinarily difficult to address. And our last pillar of apartheid, perhaps the most important in terms of thinking about the legacy of apartheid is white economic supremacy. Uh, this was something that was in place before apartheid. Um, whites dominated the South African economy even before the creation of apartheid in 1948. Um, but apartheid attempts to um, deepen um, and reaffirm that supremacy. So here's Ernest Cole again, another wonderful photograph, another fantastic piece of photojournalism um, showing this African woman um, cleaning the, the white lady's toilet, um, symbolizing the, the economic relationships that were at the heart of apartheid. Now, how was this done? How was white economic supremacy maintained and deepened by the apartheid state? Uh, essentially through three methods, through what was referred to as influx control, um, through a policy of job reservation, and finally through what was called Bantu education. Influx control is very simple. Influx control was government policy designed to control the movement of non-white people so that someone who lived in a rural area and who perhaps thought, I would like to move to the city to find work, that was very difficult to do. There were strict controls on the mobility, the movement of the non-white population in order to prevent non-white people from seeking economic opportunity. Um, and so influx control was vitally important for maintaining white dominance of the economy. Essentially, if we go back to these homelands, one of the goals of the homeland policy was to create in these homelands vast reservoirs of impoverished people who could serve as a source of cheap labor for South African agriculture, the mining industry, South African manufacturing. So apartheid is very much uh, an economic project as well as a political and social project as well. Um, a quite deliberate act of social engineering uh, whose major purpose in many ways is to ensure that South African employers, who were overwhelmingly white, had cheap labor at their disposal at all times. And so influx control is a vital part of that. And the way that influx control was enforced is that all um, non-Europeans, to use the apartheid lingo, um, had to carry a pass, had to carry a document um, which stated where they were allowed to live, where they worked, um, and this pass was the dominant document in their lives. And those who were without the proper documentation were always subject to um, arrest and expulsion back to their so-called proper location. Uh, so this photograph captures a moment where a domestic worker has been arrested um, for her pass being um, out of date. And it was extremely difficult to keep your pass um, up to date, um, deliberately so. It was a deliberately created Byzantine bureaucratic procedure uh, 
that made people vulnerable and susceptible to arrest um, at almost any time. And this is one of the foundations of white dominance of the economy. Another foundation is what they call job reservation. This is a very simple idea. Job reservation meant that certain jobs were reserved for certain racial groups. Um, so jobs that were supervisory in nature were reserved for whites. Jobs that were skilled in nature and so paid more were reserved largely for whites, although sometimes those classified as colored or Indian might have access to some um, skilled forms of labor. Africans were almost always excluded from skilled labor. So job reservation was used to ensure uh, the dominance of the more higher paying, high status occupations in South African society um, for the white population. And the final piece of this is what was called Bantu education. And here's Verward again. Hendrik Verward was in many ways the creator of a modern system of education in South Africa. Before apartheid, before Verward, uh, most black South Africans who went to school were educated by mission societies, by Christian missionaries. Um, Verward didn't like the fact that black South Africans were educated by Christian missionaries. He thought that it gave them the wrong idea. Um, and so you see here, um, if the native, another common South African term to refer to uh, black Africans, if natives today, he says, is being taught to expect that they will live under a policy of equal rights, they're making a big mistake. There is no place for the native in the European community above the level of certain forms of labor. And so Verward proposed the creation of an entirely new system of education, Bantu education, education for black Africans, whose purpose would be to not prepare them to rise above certain forms of labor and would prepare them for a life of servitude and subservience. And not surprisingly, the quality of Bantu education was shockingly poor. Um, and so we can see here a school in the 1960s, which is just built out of uh, sheets of corrugated tin or iron. Um, and so the physical infrastructure of schooling for the black majority was horrifyingly bad. Um, even when apartheid ended in the 1990s, the vast majority of South African schools for black children had no electricity, had no running water, no indoor bathroom facilities. Um, the level of the infrastructure uh, was absolutely shocking. And again, when we think about this question of the legacies of apartheid um, and how you deal with a legacy like that, uh, it illustrates the scale of the challenge. Uh, and so classrooms in horrible condition, crowded classrooms as we see here, students without desks, students working on the, on the floor. Here's Ernest Cole again. Um, this is also Ernest Cole. I love this photograph. I think it's just such a fabulous photograph you know, the concentration on his face, um, but also you can tell by the sweat, the poor conditions of the uh, environment in which he's trying to learn. Um, and so, you know, Cole has captured so brilliantly uh, the nature of Bantu education in this particular image. And so all these policies, again, what is their purpose? Their purpose is to reinforce and to deepen the dominance of the economy by the white minority. And again, in terms of the legacies of apartheid, this is going to be an extremely difficult legacy to address and overcome, um, as we'll see a little bit later, perhaps more next week than this. Now, very quickly about the anti-apartheid movement. I'm not going to talk about protests against apartheid too much, um, but from the beginning, there were movements to protest uh, apartheid policy. So for example, in the 1950s, you had what was called the defiance campaign that you see here, um, very similar to the United States Civil Rights Movement, which was kicking off at roughly the same time. Um, uh, movements of nonviolent protest, um, passive resistance um, that were crushed by the South African state. Um, you also saw a revival of anti-apartheid protest in the 1970s, uh, most famously in the Soweto uprising, where school children, Notice how young the people in this photograph are. Um, it's because they're school children and who were protesting um, educational policies imposed by the South African government. Uh, particularly, you'll see the sign where it says Afrikaans must be abolished. Afrikaans is, is the language spoken by the Afrikaner population. Afrikaans is very similar to Dutch. And what had happened in the 1970s is the South African state was requiring that uh, many subjects 
be taught in Afrikaans, a language, of course, that most Black South Africans did not speak. Um, they were being forced to learn it because they were supposed to learn the language of their future employers. Um, but not only were they going to be instructed in Afrikaans, government policy was that they would learn, for example, math in Afrikaans in order to uh, improve their facility in the language. Uh, this kicked off a massive student protest in 1976 that eventually becomes a massive national protest um, and which results in probably the most famous photograph taken um, in the entire history of the apartheid state. During the Soweto uprising in 1976, a young man uh, named Hector Peterson, who was 12 years old, was shot and killed by the police. Um, and Sam and Zima, a, a photojournalist, captured this image of Muisa Makubo um, carrying Hector Peterson's body um, trying to get him medical attention. And the, the young woman running alongside um, is uh, Hector Peterson's sister. This became the iconic image um, of apartheid. It was seen around the world um, and it became a centerpiece of anti-apartheid protest. Um, so this um, image is from the British anti-apartheid movement and you can see they've used um, Enzima's photograph as a centerpiece of their efforts to convince people to boycott South African goods, which became part of the international movement against apartheid. So there was a long history of anti-apartheid struggle, which culminated in the 1990s. Nelson Mandela, who had been a leader of the African National Congress, the main anti-apartheid organization, Mandela had been in prison for 27 years. He was released in 1990. And there's really one key point that I'd like to stress about this. And this feeds into this issue of legacy. It's very important to understand that the end of apartheid was a negotiated process. The apartheid government was not overthrown. It was not um, gotten rid of in that sense, that the African National Congress led by Mandela entered into a process of negotiation with the existing government in which they agreed upon the holding of elections and the movement towards a fully democratic constitution. Now, of course, in many ways, this was a very good thing because the process of negotiation meant that the end of apartheid was not the product of colossal violence, which many people expected. In the 1980s, there was a great expectation that South Africa was destined for uh, horrific violence because of the struggle between the apartheid state and the anti-apartheid movement. Um, there was a, a joke that people would tell in South Africa in the 1980s, a form of black humor, uh, where people would say, well, you know, how are we going to end our problems peacefully? And they would say, well, we could end our problems peacefully in one of two ways. There's the miraculous, miraculous option, or there's the realistic option. So maybe God will send his angels to earth, and they will convince us all to live peacefully with one another. That's the realistic option. The miraculous option is that maybe we'll figure out how to do it ourselves. And so you can see the, the black humor behind the joke, the sense of pessimism about the future of the country. That did not come to pass. Instead, the ANC and the government negotiate an end to apartheid, resulting in a fully democratic election, really the first democratic election in South Africa's history in 1994. Um, here's Mandela voting in the election at which Mandela was elected president. But the fact that this was negotiated is perfectly exemplified in the fact that Mandela and F.W. de Klerk, who was the last apartheid president of South Africa, together received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1993, because it was the two of them together who brought apartheid to an end. But because this was a negotiated process, it meant that the amount of change that was imposed was somewhat lessened than it might have been. Let's put it that way. Uh, and this will be a theme that we'll return to. So apartheid ends in the 1990s and it ends through a process of negotiation. And it creates a tremendous moment of optimism, um, not just in South African history, but really in global history. Uh, the release of, of Mandela, the victory of the ANC was seen as a sort of turning point. It came fairly soon after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I think it fed into this great sense of optimism about the future of uh, humanity that was present in the late 80s and early 90s, um, which I think has been somewhat disappointed. Um, so this cartoon by the fabulous South African cartoonist Zapiro, 
I think captures that sense of optimism. Uh, Mandela as the sun, right? The new South African flag that you see on the flagpole and the trash bin of South Africa's apartheid history. The flag that you see in the trash can is the old South African flag, the apartheid era flag that was replaced by the new flag that you see um, on the flagpole here. And this is the beginning of this idea of the rainbow nation. The idea that post-apartheid South Africa was going to become a model for the world, a model for moving past its history of racism. This term comes from Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who you see here, a Desmond Tutu who was also a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, Soweto, which was uh, sort of the largest black neighborhood in South Africa in Johannesburg, um, residents of Soweto proudly note that uh, Soweto is the only place in the world where you had two Nobel Peace Prize winners living on the same street because Mandela and Tutu lived on the same street for a time. Desmond Tutu said in 1991 that he sometimes would ask people to put their hands together and he would say, look at you, you are the rainbow people of God. And this idea, this phrase was then picked up by Nelson Mandela in his inauguration speech in 1994, um, where he referred to South Africa as a rainbow nation that he hoped would be at peace with itself and the world. And so what is the legacy of this period and how will that legacy be dealt with? Um, and I'll end with this cartoon, uh, which is from May 12, 1994, which was men when Mandela became president. And so here's Mandela arriving for his first day of work. Um, and you can see on the wall, the portraits of all his predecessors um, as the leader of South Africa. And of course, these are all the leaders of apartheid era South Africa, none of whom seem terribly happy um, to see him there. Uh, and that's F.W. de Klerk climbing out of the last painting because de Klerk was at that time Mandela's deputy vice president because of the specific nature of the South African constitution. But look at the right um, and look at the pile of problems land restitution, violence, housing, education, unemployment, all problems that can be traced to apartheid itself. And so when we think about this question of legacy, this is a great example of what that legacy looks like. Um, a society riven by problems that had been created by a decades long history of systematic brutalization. I think that was the word I heard earlier um, a system based on a racial classification of its population, which denied opportunity to the majority of that population. And so the great challenge for post-apartheid South Africa is how do you deal with that legacy and how do you attempt to overcome it? Uh, and again, for this lecture series, I thought that this was an interesting question because in the United States, we are also continually dealing with uh, our own legacies of discrimination and oppression um, and trying to figure out how to deal with those legacies as well. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I would be happy to entertain any questions about any of the things that I've talked about so far. Uh, and certainly we can uh, pick up on some of these themes again next week. Well, I have a question. Yes. Uh, I was... I'm very happy to see Ernst, Ernst Cole and Peter Mugambi. I've asked you about him before, I think. Uh, and I even read that he used to like hide his camera in a loaf of bread or something like that. Did, did they have platforms um, where their pictures could be shown or was there suppression of that too? So South Africa is kind of a, a funny case in terms of media because certainly the South African government had powers of censorship, but in some ways South Africa had a reasonably free press. You know, it was not a totalitarian society. You know, it was not the Soviet Union. And so there were papers, liberal papers, that would publish articles critical of apartheid. So it was possible to be a photojournalist um, and to have your work published in the paper. Um, but I think also some of them also work for interna international syndicates, right? They work for the Associated Press and things like that. And so some of their photographs were perhaps more well known internationally than they were within South Africa itself. Mm, great. Thank you. Yeah.
I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Nicole. I'm sorry, Carolina. I have a question for you, but I'm sorry if I, sorry if I may have missed this. But was there something about the land, like the physical geographical land of South Africa, that made it so? I don't know if the word right word is appealing or right for a colonization or like how did it all come about, I guess? So the short answer would be that the earliest European colonization was um, Dutch settlers who um, came to farm. Um, and the Western part of South Africa is the land isn't particularly great. It's, it's, a, it's a tough life um, because it's pretty arid. So it's not great. The Eastern part of the country especially in say Zululand, it's, it's wetter. And so you, that's where the great sugar plantations are, for example. Um, so that was a draw, but the big draw for European colonization was the discovery of, of diamonds and gold in the late 19th century. That's when you saw a much larger scale arrival of Europeans. And that's why South Africa became the richest country in Africa because of the, the vast wealth that people found in, in the diamond mines and the gold mines. I have a question and I don't know if you know the answer. I just found it very fascinating that um, the flyer that you had showed that um, you said um, the UK uh, put out kind of um, asking people not to purchase products from South Africa. I think that's very interesting because like, were there any, any parallels or similar examples like uh, like, I guess what I'm what I'm really asking is like, what what's really the difference between like racism that was happening in the U.S. at the same time um, versus like the apartheid in South Africa? Was it because it was like more like governmental, like explicit structures rather than implicit or, you know, were there like flyers from other countries like boycott U.S. products because they don't treat people fairly or, you know, like it just it doesn't seem like there's that much of a difference in what was actually happening, but the way the world saw it and has seen it just seems to be so vastly different. So to some degree, I, I don't know the answer. And I think it's a really interesting question. I, I would love to know in say the 50s and 60s, especially when the US civil rights movement was at its peak, what the international reaction to that was, because I don't know. Uh, the one, the only thing I do know is that um, in in the Soviet bloc, um, there was a lot of attention to civil rights as a way of sort of showing the failures of capitalist society to say, look, this is what we these are the problems we don't have, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I think part of what's going on is also just the fact that there was it was a lot easier to have international media attention by the 80s. Um, you know, with television, you could have pictures. Um, and, and so it became much easier to sort of document and show um, something like the apartheid state in action, whereas in the 50s and 60s, it was a little trickier. So I think part of it has to do with the international media environment as well. But yeah, I, I, I don't know about the first part. And, you know, I'd love to know what they were saying in, you know, France or Western Europe um, about the civil rights movement at the time, because um, I don't really know much about that. even though post 45 Europe is supposedly one of my specialties, but you know, we, we won't mention that. I, um, I guess the international, I grew up in Haiti and we studied uh, um, the American history. We studied uh, around the world history. So you had a little bit about what was going on around the world. And um, whereas in the United States, um, the, the, you can say there was a bubble. Well, the people who were inside of the bubble of the economic power and the political power didn't know. And all the people in charge knew, but the people that were leaving the benefit or reaping the benefit didn't know what was going on around the world. Therefore, it was easier for the those who were thinking about taking possession of the richness of the other countries was easier for them to, um, to help the people who were benefiting from it to understand that this is what is done. This is what is supposed to happen in order for you to live the way 
you were you were living and it was um easier for them to uh manipulate or to pressure the people to understand that you cannot reach that status uh you have to stay in your place so there wasn't any connection with the people inside of, of the bubble and the people outside of the bubble psychologically but the work was being done the nannies would do the work the people from the mines would do the work the agricultures would do the work but psychologically there was no interaction where one can understand the pain or the opulence the 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 richness of the other one i don't know if that makes sense to you yeah no absolutely so, and 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 i think to your so, point and, and maybe back to colleen's point a little bit too another vital context for this is is the cold war um because south africa got a very easy ride for a long time because the south african government did a fantastic job at presenting itself as a, an ally against communism so uh, I, I didn't use it in, in the presentation, but I have an image of a poster from the 1980s, a poster that says, Hang Nelson Mandela, produced by the Association of British Conservative University Students, because Nelson Mandela was labeled in some circles as a communist, which he was not, and a terrorist. Uh -huh. And South Africa did a, a really effective job for a long time at portraying itself as a kind of bulwark against communism in Africa. and so. In the West, in the United States, um, apartheid kind of got off scot-free for a long time um, without criticism. Um, remarkably so, from I think from our perspective, looking back, it's it's shocking. But um, in the context of the Cold War, um, that was really the driving factor for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And in your lecture, we I can see I cannot say we I can see a lot of similarities with what was going on in America and what was going on in, it's like they understood what was at stake, was at all costs maintain the white race, maintain white power over those that we deem have no, no power. All the, all the richness, they own all the richness, but uh, um, with their, education with their uh, um, wit to con the people to take whatever they own and make it their own and make you believe that you didn't own it. It was never yours. It, we, we were just not in the land, but it was always ours. So that, um, that, uh, um, attitude was the attitude that was going on in the United States. So, and it, it spilled over to the other countries, to the Caribbean, like in Haiti, all they had to say was you are communist and the, gov the government would just arrest you. So many families lost their, uh, um, the patriarch of their family because they qualified them as communists and they were arrested and you never saw them again. So it was a brutal regime going on in South Africa, in the United States, you could see residues in all the other countries in the Caribbean. Wow. Yeah, and, and there's there's the strongest parallels with the United States is is in the anti-apartheid movement, because the parallels to the civil rights movement are very strong, right? So that you had in the 1950s, you had an anti-apartheid movement that was um, very much focused on mass protest, nonviolence, but because of the resistance to those movements, right, resistance to change, you have in South Africa by the 70s the rise of what was called the Black Consciousness Movement which you know, has some parallels perhaps with you know, the Black Panthers um, and those types of movements. So there's, there's parallels in the evolution of anti-apartheid ideology as well. So there's parallels in the systemic, in the systems that are created, but also parallels in the ways that people 
push back against those uh, systems also. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of historical work that's comparative between the two, between the US and South Africa, um, because there, there's certainly many parallels that you can find. Mm -hmm. And how do you think the uh, missionaries help in either making the what was going on uh, in South Africa open to the rest of the world? And how do you think they help with the situation to make well, the, it the, better? The greatest role that the missionaries play in many ways is that if you look at the history of anti-apartheid struggle, almost all of the leadership comes out of mission education. Mandela was educated in mission school. Um, Govan and Becky um, was educated in mission school. You know, if you, if you sort of tick off the top names, especially in the early history of, of anti-apartheid struggle, they came through the system of mission education because the system of mission education was not built on notions of inequality and inferiority in the way that Bantu education was. And so you had people who were, um, you know, received excellent educations in many cases from, from missionary organizations. Mandela went on to law school um, and it trained that generation of leaders, which is one of the reasons Verward wanted to get rid of it because he, he recognized that it was educating people at least to some degree in ideas of equality. Now the record is not perfect. Uh, so for example, the Dutch Reformed Church, which is the primary um, religious organization of Afrikaners, um, practiced its own form of religious apartheid, um, really, anticipated apartheid in the 1930s by arguing that um, blacks and whites should worship separately, that they should have separate churches and that you should not have uh, integrated churches. And so in many ways, developed the ideas of segregation that apartheid would build on. But missionary societies in general play a vital role in the anti-apartheid struggle, um, both explicitly that you had many religious leaders who were involved in the struggle, but also in educating those who led that struggle. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ben. I'm, I'm, I, I'm looking at our clock now. See, we're, we're about, just about 10 after uh, six, and so many great questions um, have come up, and you've answered a lot. Um, and so I'm going to, um, I guess, politely ask that if, if we have any remaining questions, that we can you know, um, save those for next week um, as we bring this to a close. Um, Stacey, did you have something that you wanted to add or? No, no, I'll, I'll, polite, I'll politely save it because I was like, want to ask. And then, oh, I'll, no, no, that's all right. That's all right. I've been enjoying the questions and discussion. Uh, yeah. And so I think that with all these questions, we have a right conversation for next week. And I know that Ben has more content to deliver to, deliver to us. We look forward to, uh, to saying that. Um, so, again, so this is just part one. And so, and so um, unlike maybe in uh, for topics past, instead of having a, like a part one lecture, part two discussion, um, as Ben mentioned, we're going to have a um, kind of two-part discussion slash lecture presentation, right? So um, you know, feel free to bring any questions that you might have then. Uh, but also feel free to bring a friend, right? So we want to you know, kind of continue this knowledge base, make sure that you know other folks are um, also jumping on the proverbial bandwagon of like, or not, or I guess train of like, um, in, of, of raising our collective conscience right here at Co-op Law. Um, so Very thank you all. Encourage students in your classes to come as well. <laughs> yes, thank you for that, Colleen. So thank you so much, everyone, for taking some time out of your Monday evenings uh, to join us. Thank you again, especially um, to Ben for leading this uh, dynamic um, presentation and discussion. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all next Monday at 5 o'clock. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.